At the time of the transcendentalist philosophers, such as Emerson and Thoreau, it was already realized that nature was not an endless resource. This awareness continued and magnified over time. As the degradation of wild lands increased as a result of industry, development, and progress. We will trace these developing conceptions through some key examples of landscape painting. This first image shows a lot of the idealism of nature that we saw in Peaceable Kingdom. We see Native Americans living in harmony with a serene and beautiful landscape. This painting by Thomas Cole has a similar serene beauty, but also a sense of foreboding. Notice the dark cloud at the left of the image. It is unclear exactly how we should interpret the dark cloud in this scene. Notice the broken tree in the foreground as well. What is Cole saying here? This image has sometimes been interpreted as a foreboding of the challenges and destruction to nature that would be brought by the European settlers as they moved their way west like a dark and destructive storm. Look at this image from several years after Cole's painting. One thing you might have noticed is that Church has gone to the Andes to find his pristine scene. One reason for this is because the pristine landscape along the Hudson River is now no longer so pristine. Americans began to look beyond their own soil for that paradisical image of the Garden of Eden. Notice this image from seven years later. How does this image make you feel about nature and the place of humans in nature? This image gives a sense of the ambiguity about development and progress. The colors are warm. The landscape is beautiful. We can see that nature is still prolific and abundant. There is also something quaint and endearing about the cottage settlement. But at the same time, that we look upon this homestead as a place of idyllic living, we cannot help but be aware of the elements of nature that were displaced to create this homestead. There is a sense of loss and sorrow that accompanies that beauty. Eventually, landscapes become a way to self-consciously think back to a way of life that people know is vanishing. An early awareness of that threat that follows prolific development is seen in a series of paintings by Thomas Cole entitled The Course of Empire. Here we see the first painting. In this painting we see the land in a beautiful and rural pastoral state. The only evidence of development is seen in the ruins in the background. Other than that, the people seem to be living close to nature. But as time develops, this pastoral landscape becomes entirely transformed. A huge and prosperous city is erected. Giant buildings are constructed and rivers are tamed for the purpose of construction. But as time develops, this pastoral landscape becomes entirely transformed. A huge and prosperous city is erected, giant buildings are constructed, and rivers are tamed for the purposes of commerce. But in the end, Thomas Cole reminds us, nature will have its way. The human mark on the landscape is never permanent. We might even wonder if this civilization has used up its resources, as so many have, and returned to desolation as a result of that development. In the early 1900s, John Muir 
played a major part in taking the awareness and appreciation of nature and convincing Americans that it was something worth fighting for. This quote is from his 1901 work, Our National Parks. Thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home, that wilderness is a necessity, and that mountain parks and reservations are useful not only as fountains of timber and irrigation rivers, but as fountains of life. John Muir, Our National Parks, 1901. To this day, there are many competing interests influencing our attitude toward even nationally protected wildlands. It is somewhat ironic that the inspirational slogan for our national forest is simply, National Forest, Land of Many Uses. Industry, development, and environmentalists continue to work to influence the use of nationally protected land to their own interests. This slogan brings out the fact that we as Americans are still trying to work out what our relationship to federally protected lands ought to be. This question mirrors the larger ambivalence Americans have about cherishing, protecting, using, and developing our natural resources. These conflicts continue to influence us today as we decide in our own communities how we will allow land to be developed, what we will do with pasture land, where our homes will be built, and how our contemporary lifestyle will relate to nature. In our next discussion, we will turn our thoughts to look directly at our own community and ways in which these ideals can influence our attitudes, ideas, and actions.